This is not how creation is meant to be. This is this is just a very, very dark place. Scientists more and more in the mainstream are saying, well, actually, it does look like we're in a simulation. What the Gnostics describe, I think they were spot on. I mean, I, I've come across the same thing, is that this simulation is a copy, a digital copy on one level of the prime reality, because this earth exists in prime reality. And it's on that higher frequency, higher vibration, that much more ethereal vibration. And it's heart-centered, and it's a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful place, like creation in general overwhelmingly is. You can remember, you can feel where we come from and, and, and the, the scale of love that's there, where we come from. You can't look your own kids in the eye, your own grandkids in the eye. You have to do everything you can to make a difference. I'm driven by wanting to break the stranglehold that this force has on human perception. And I'm driven by wanting to know the truth. Hey, Inspired Tribe, how's it going? Welcome to a very inspired conversation today. I'm extremely honored and excited to welcome the one and only Mr. David Icke. Thank you so much for taking the time today. No problem. I think you do, uh, you do great work. I love your videos. Oh, I really appreciate that, David. And you have been an integral part of the Inspired channel uh, since this year, 2021, really but an integral part of our journey. And um, I'd like to start with a question that's maybe a little odd, but I think it might give a broader perspective. David, if you had to um, bring someone up to speed as to what's going on in the world that had just woken up from a two and a half year coma, how would you describe the state of the world? We have a a human race that has conceded its right to control its own perception. And because perception leads to behavior, giving up perception has led to behavior that has allowed a very few people to impose their will upon billions and turn this planet into um, basically a mind prison. And that's what everything has to be, really. If you want to control people, you have to create a mind prison because of everything that comes from that. I mean, we, everything we do, everything we don't do, everything we allow ourselves to um, acquiesce to, everything that we, we resist acquiescing to, these are all expressions of a person's perception. And uh, the difference between those that have conceded their, their uniqueness, their right to freedom, they are people who have conceded their right to reach their own conclusions. Because the conclusion for those people comes not at the end of the process, it comes at the start. And the conclusion actually is not part of a process of reaching a opinion. It's all that exists in the process. And what I mean by that is authority says this is how things are. And someone who has given away their right to form their own perceptions, then accepts what authority tells them is true and reacts, behaves on the basis of that. Whereas those who are awakening, and I, I never, unless I you know, slip my tongue, say awake, because we're all in a process of awakening, uh, those who are awakening, um, they have a process. They look at information from different sources, authority and uh, other um, sources of information and evidence. And they process that information into their own unique conclusion. And when they do that, they come to very different conclusions to those that just um, concede their right to think. And we are seeing now in this 
ever gathering extreme of the COVID era, the very clear expressions of the difference between not controlling your perceptions and controlling your perceptions, or at least having a massive impact on them. Uh, because we are looking at two very, very different groups of people uh, who are very different because they have very different perceptions and therefore they behave differently. And uh, it's never been, I mean, the, the, these two groups have always been there to be seen throughout human history and in every culture. This is why if you look through human history, and which we perceive history anyway, the few have always controlled the many because the great majority have always gone through this process of conceding their right to form their own perceptions and taking them from authority. Either that or the other group that concedes its um, right to um, make its own decisions is another group that really can see some of it and doesn't uh, really want to do what it's being told to do, but does it anyway because it fears the consequences of not doing so. So those two groups throughout human history, those that just um, uh, do what they're told without question and those that do what they're told even though they'd rather not do it, they are the, the two groups that have allowed every tyranny in history to be formed because tyrannies are run by the few. and Therefore, the mathematics alone say that that can't happen unless great numbers of the many are in those two groups. And if you look again through history, and uh, it's just a recurring theme, it's just incredibly extreme now and in our face, you see that this other group that forms its own uh, opinions and to a much greater extent controls its own perceptions and crucially retains that self-respect, they are always the people that bring tyrannies down, always. Of course, the asleep and the, the fearful are not going to bring tyrannies down. They may follow on after it's all in a you know, momentum, but it's those that, will not concede their right to their perceptions. For instance, these other groups will accept that two and two equals five, A, because they do it without question and believe it without question, or because they fear not believing or living their life as if two and two equals five. And this other group, the awakening group, says, actually, um, it equals four, and I'm not conceding one smear of an inch beyond that. You can throw at me what you like. You can intimidate me or try to as much as you like, but I'm not going to concede my right to see that two and two equals four. And I'm doing that because my self-respect will not allow it. My self-respect is not for sale. And so you can threaten me in any way you like, but you're never going to get my self-respect. Yes. And eventually it's, it's the self-respect that says, no, 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 no. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the ridiculous things that you are telling me to do and ridiculous people are telling me to do them. I'm not conceding my self-respect to that. Of course not, I'll die first. And th so you have now in this modern world, this very clear two divisions of, of two groups. One that allow tyranny and without which tyranny couldn't ha happen. Fascism is not brought in by fascists, there's never enough of them. Fascism is brought in by the great majority of the population conceding and, and acquiescing to fascism. So you've got that group. And then you've got the other group um, being targeted more and more, of course, and demonized more and more because what's behind this knows that they're the ones that can bring them down. 
who are um, saying, uh, no, we're not going to um, do what you tell us and we're not going to concede our right to our own opinion. We're not going to give you our self-respect. And this group will eventually bring this tyranny down because this group always does. I wanted to go um, into something you always say. You People say, what is the solution? I know they ask you and you always say, hold on a minute, you're talking about a solution, you're going one step uh, too far. We need to remove the cause of the problem. That's really what we need to do first. And I wanted to ask you, because I know in, in, the, in the decades of research that you've done and in the travels, and you've gone into many different cultures and tribes and, and looked into our history and the history of very different cultures. And I noticed in doing some of the same things, a theme, And the theme that I noticed in many cultures and tribes is that when they tell about their um, history, they almost all say there was a time when we lived in harmony with nature, with each other. It was a very peaceful, blissful time. And almost all described that at some point, strangers arrived that brought about this darkness, uh, warfare. And the proof is in the pudding. If we look at the, the world today, it's absolutely that. But how do we remove this cause, this darkness, especially if we, I mean, if we can agree, if not just on a spiritual level, but also on a physical level, that this force doesn't appear to be human? How do we remove this root cause? Well, there are many levels to that, obviously. I mean, we can go into the, um, the nature of the force that's uh, behind this global cult the force that these um, Satanists in the global cult worship in their rituals. And it's a non-human force. I mean, uh, as you say, I, I looked and met so many people around the world in different cultures and looked at what the cultures say and what the legends say, what the accounts say. And again and again, you're seeing a non-human force being described as a manipulator of human society. And it seems to take a reptilian form, not only a reptilian form, but that seems to be the dominant force, the one that's really calling the shots. But then you can go deeper and you can say, well, it doesn't matter whether we're looking at something that's human or something that's not human, that's reptilian, that's one of these greys. It doesn't matter um, uh, in the foundation of it all, because how that form, if you like, behaves is dictated by its perception. So what we're looking at, at the bottom of this rabbit hole is a state of perception. And uh, you mentioned it earlier. Um, I, I've been talking about a mind virus for decades, a mind virus that's manipulating human perception and uh, directing human psychology. And uh, then uh, but much more recently, I, I came across uh, the concept in the Native American arena uh, in terms of um, the description of a, a mind virus, which they call Watiko, at least the Cree tribal group do. And um, I read about Watiko and I thought, this is exactly the mind virus I've been writing about. Uh, and It's uh, a state of consciousness that's incredibly distorted and inverted. That's why it inverts everything. If you look at the, um, the, the Satanists, they invert all their symbols. Their symbols are the inverted pentagram, the inverted cross. Everything is upside down. And if you look at the word evil, it's the word live written backwards. And that's very appropriate because this... Um, Watiko consciousness, which drives this re these reptilians and drives this global cult, drives your Gateses and drives your Fauci's and uh, drives your um, Klaus Schwab's. Um, it's um, a uh, inversion of love. In fact, my definition of evil is the absence of love. You take love out and you've got evil. You put love in and evil is gone. And so uh, it sounds trite and simplistic, but it's not, it's profound. The answer to evil is not more evil, what you fight you become, it's love. 
And what we've done, and it's been systematically distorted on purpose, is lost the meaning of love. We now connect in the human expression of it, love with attraction. Now it can be, uh, uh, part of it can be attraction. It can be a physical attraction. But the love I'm talking about is, is well beyond that. Love is that which connects us to outside this madhouse, which I say is a simulation actually, um, to that which drives um, the vast overwhelming majority of infinite uh, consciousness, infinite possibility, and that's love. And what's happened is that humans have been manipulated into a fake reality, a simulation, think matrix, that um, has sought to disconnect us, to separate us from that enormity of love. And what is love? Love is all that is, has been, and ever can be. Love is all possibility. Love is all potential. Love is um, that which says, I will always do what I know to be right, and I will not think about consequences, because to think consequences will be to consider not doing what I know to be right. I'm doing what I know to be right because I'm coming from love. Love um, through, through this heart vortex is how we connect with the great beyond outside of this mind prison, which is what it is. This simulation, is a, this matrix is a mind prison, a perception prison. And um, the whole idea is to stop us making that connection, to keep us separated. And in simple terms, or not even simple terms, very accurate terms, I would suggest, to hold our point of attention and our source of perception in the five senses and the immediate subconscious around the five senses. That's where they want to isolate us. Because what the idea is, is to isolate us in the five senses and then to program those senses with a version of reality. So that version of reality, version of perception becomes um, one which allows the uh, force of control to control uh, to its heart, heart's content. Because you can't see literally beyond the end of your nose when you're in that state. If you look at uh, how the five senses decode reality, they, they can see only certain frequencies that we call form we call solidity, they're not really, but they appear to act to the five senses. But in between the form, the five senses see empty space, they don't see anything else. So everything's apart from everything else to the five senses, it's the only way it can see the world. Whereas when you um, expand your awareness out of the five senses, you start to think, realize that everything's connected, um, that, that there is no empty space, that between or that which, the five senses perceives as empty space is actually consciousness, awareness, like one vast conscious Wi-Fi field connecting everything. And we are interacting with it. It's affecting us and we're affecting that just like fish uh, and sea life are swimming in an ocean. The ocean is that which connects everything. Uh, uh, but they don't want us to uh, realize that we're part of one massive infinite uh, whole dominated by, by love beyond the, our understanding of what love is. They want us to think that we are simply irrelevant, powerless individuals apart from every other individual, apart from every other expression of life, like the trees and the, the air and the, 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 um, the natural world in general so that we are operating as, as merely one isolated uh, um, computer system, if you like, uh, when we're actually all connected. So this separation is absolutely vital. And I've symbolized it as the, uh, the computer being symbolic of the body-mind, as I call it, the five sense 
uh, uh, level of uh, perception. And the um, operator being symbolic of this greater consciousness that we're all part of and should be part of uh, in, in full awareness. And when you've got the operator and the computer working in harmony, the computer operator's got the big picture, he's got the mouse, he's got the keyboard, and he's working with the computer. Um, and you've got everything you need. You've got that which is directly experiencing the reality you want to experience, i.e. the five sense level of, of humans. But you've got the bigger picture. You've got the panorama that puts that into perspective, which is not ever in perspective if that is all you perceive. And what this uh, force, this Watiko force on the level of consciousness, through its agents of many and various kinds, everything from reptilians to greys to the global cult and your Bill Gates and all these people, they're trying to um, get into that space between the consciousness, the operator, and the uh, computer, the body mind, and isolate. That's the whole foundation of it. And uh, so the awakening, as, they, as, as it's called, is, is what? It's the awakening from the five sense perceptual prison and expanding into a, a, a much greater swathe of consciousness from which you can glean the insight, the knowledge, the intuitive knowing that allows you to see from a greater perspective what the five sense world is and what it's actually experiencing. And, you know, um, all around the world, you see this recurring theme, a story I'm quickly going to do bullet point, um, in different cultures, and it's described in different ways, but exactly the same in theme different names and you know, different um, ways of describing it, but it's the same thing. And you can pick it up in ancient cultures and you can pick it up in the different religions too. So if we take um, the biblical version, um, we have a, a, a force, a, an expression of this Watiko that takes a reptilian form. And uh, the cultures around the world, again and again and again, when they're doing their creation myths, then some kind of reptilian, lizard-like, snake-like uh, entities are described. So if you take the biblical version, uh, you have um, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve is, uh, or are, symbolic of first of all what humans were like before what became known as the fall what the hell was the fall the way i've seen this is that there was once not something that you'd call human it was a state of consciousness that um was experiencing a, uh, a world, a frequency band that was um, like the one we're experiencing, but on a much higher level of awareness, consciousness, frequency. So things weren't happening in dense matter and, 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 and like treacle-like low, slow frequencies. They were happening on a high frequency. Things were much more ethereal. Um, and that, I think, uh, is um, what's described as this paradise mm -hmm. that went before. And so Adam and Eve were cast out of paradise. What does that mean, I would suggest? They were... Um, they left that frequency level where what we now call humans were, were experiencing. A, a world of love, of 
of, of, of joy, of happiness, of, of all the things that happen when you get into high frequency states where so much more is possible. And they fell, the fall was down the frequencies into dense matter. And the villain in the Garden of Eden that is said to have been part of this or central to this is the snake. Now, I mean, you people have to think symbolically. I mean, this is not a snake that can talk. This is symbolic of this reptilian group, not just one person, this reptilian group, these reptilian gods as they were um, perceived. And they fell down the frequencies, Adam and Eve, symbolic of what's now humanity, because they gained the knowledge of good and evil. What is good and evil? It's polarity. Um, it's um, the polarity that we, we see in our reality now. That level that um, we fell from was oneness. It was unity. And we fell into um, the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of polarity, which is what this world is. And my view, and it has been... Um, for a lot, a lot of years now, is that what Genesis is describing is the takeover of um, human perception by this reptilian force. And um, the, the God at the start of Genesis that is creating the world is actually an amalgamation to deceive and misdirect of the gods, the reptilian gods. And what's being described is not the creation of the world, but the creation of the simulation, the matrix. Um, and so when we hear lines like, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, I say what's being described is electromagnetic light, which is basically what this uh, simulation is. Uh, and the, I said just after the turn of the millennium that this is a simulation and the walls of it, certainly at our level anyway, are the speed of light, which is not the fastest speed possible. That's a joke. We're dealing with all possibility here. <laughs> That's the fastest speed possible. It's a joke. It's the speed and, and, uh, of, the, of the matrix of the simulation. And there was an article in Scientific American in um, April of this year, where some academic said, we live in a simulation and the walls of the simulation are the speed of light. And he was relating the speed of light in simulation terms to the processing speed. Because, um, you know, what is, what is physics? What is the law of physics, as, as we call it? It's whatever the creator of the simulation decided it was going to be. What are, in effect, the laws of physics of computer games? They're whatever the creator of the game decides they're going to be. But as this article pointed out, you can create the laws within your game, but you're still going to be limited by the processing speed you're dealing with. And that's why the speed of light is, is, is this faster speed. The laws of physics within this simulation um, are there because they've been created by the creators of the simulation. That's why when people have near-death experiences, they leave um, uh, the, the body, which is locking us into the simulation through the five senses. And they experience a totally different version of physics, where past, present and future uh, all kind of happen at once in the same now. But within the simulation, we have time, creation of the simulation. We have all these other illusions, which are the creation of the simulation. So um, you, um, you had this, um, uh, this, uh, th this treasure trove of documents that were found at Nagamadi uh, in um, 1945, about 75 miles north of Luxor in Egypt, which was an earthen jar of the writings of the Gnostic people. Um, and it's reckoned that they were put in that jar about, I don't know, 400 AD, something like that. And about a fifth 
of these writings were about what they called archons, which is Greek for rulers, um, who were manipulating human society. And what they say in this, these, um, these writings is that this world is a fake world. It's a fake reality created by this archontic force to enslave humanity in an illusion. And when I've got all the all the writings up here in the, the two very, very big books, and I, I, I went through all of them and, and you, you, what you see, they're describing a virtual reality universe. That's what they're describing in their own language, what we would call today virtual reality. One of the great things today is that because of the technological advancement, so-called, we, we've now got the analogies to and, and the, the, the experience of virtual reality to actually um, uh, describe what this reality is. So um, if you look at the Matrix movies, uh, the, the people uh, around the Morpheus character in the, in the ship, they never entered the Matrix physically. They entered it perceptually. And so um, they would sit in that chair and there'd be a probe in the back of their neck, actually where the reptilian brain is, what they call the reptilian brain part of the human brain. And that information would then be decoded by the brain um, in the very same way as you're sitting in a room and you put a headset on of a virtual reality game. And now your brain is um, it's decoding of what we call normal reality, i.e. the simulation, is overridden by the uh, information from the game and, and people start to thrash about as if what's being presented to them in the headset is actually real. And it's the same principle. So this, um, this probe goes in the back of the neck and the brain, which is not the source of consciousness, it's a processor of information, starts to process that information and suddenly they, the person experiences being in the matrix but they're not actually in the matrix except through here. And so you had this simulation created and then um, you had the human body created, Adam and Eve and all that stuff, which was a, um, the vehicle to entrap, this is what the Gnostics said, the body is trap, to um, entrap consciousness perception in the body, and the body was the, the, the interaction with the, um, with the game. And what they did was make sure that the DNA of the new human was um, operating on relatively low frequencies, because the cutting edge of science, the R Russian scientists have done a lot of great work on this, uh, it is that they know that DNA is a receiver transmitter of information. It's what it's doing. It's a big part of what we're uh, uh, um, interacting with and what we're not. And so the idea is to keep that in a, in a, in a, in a low state. So we could basically only um, interact with a, a very uh, uh, small amount of, of reality and perceive it. This is why, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the simulation, um, it's reckoned to be like 0.005% of, of actually what exists. Uh, and visible light, which is the only frequency band that we can see through the decoding system of the body, um, is a smear of the 0.005%. People think when they look out of their eyes, or they think they're looking out of their eyes, that they can uh, they can see everything in the space they're looking at. They can only see a tiny band of frequency, like one television station within the vastness of television stations. And, and I've, I've said for a long time, I don't think that this ridiculously narrow band of frequency that we can see is an accident. It's there to keep us in ignorance. And then what they did was create another um, bloodline network which had a much greater infusion of reptilian genetics. The human body had an infusion of reptilian genetics. That's where the reptilian brain comes from. Um, but this, these other bloodlines had a big infusion of reptilian genetics and a, and a different DNA frequency transmitter receiver system. 
so they can see things deeper into the field than humans can in a normal state and so they had then to preserve this particular code and it's a hybrid code part human massive infusion of reptilian it's it's basically a a hybrid of the two and so we have had throughout this period this incessant interbreeding what we call royalty and aristocracy the blue bloods um all over the world and these um blue bloods were perceived to be royalty special why because they they they, they were different not special different because of this um infusion and these uh, this infusion bloodline was designed to rule humanity on behalf of the the reptilian uh, gods and so for a long long time they did it openly through royalty and aristocracy then there came a point where humanity grew up enough to start to reject over control by royal bloodline where we still have it ludicrously in britain um, and then um, at that point, this bloodline started moving out of overt royalty and aristocracy and, and into um, the dark suit professions of politics and banking and business and all this stuff. And, um, but they've gone on into breeding ever since. Um, you know, you have the Eastern establishment families of the United States. They obsessively interbreed just like royalty because they're trying to hold this code that gives them this, these uh, extra abilities. Uh, because if they started um, interbreeding with the, the mass of humanity, those codes would be very quickly diluted. So um, this is where all this comes from. And so when you're looking at your Gateses and your Swabs and even deeper in, because they're all gophers even at that level, um, you're, you're looking at these, uh, these hybrids, which are described in the, the Bible as the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. It's described in the Bible in terms, this infusion of reptilian genetics as the sons of God, which in the original before the translation says sons of the gods, um, interbred with the daughters of men, creating this Nephilim. And this Nephilim, uh, in effect, is running the world today. But it's, um, it's, it's done it um, by appearing to be uh, human, uh, like the rest of the human population. And the, this, the, the analogy of what's happening and what has happened uh, it was given to us by the Avatar movie, where um, the uh, American military arrive on this moon, this Pandora moon, and um, they want to infiltrate the society of these Navi, these blue people, as they were portrayed in the uh, Avatar movie. But they know that if they start to try to, and, and these American military coming to, the, the, the Navi society see reptilians coming to human society. They, um, they knew that um, they couldn't infiltrate Navi society because it would be obvious what they were doing because they look so bloody different. So what they did is they took an outer shell, the avatar of the Navi um, body form, and they infiltrated their society while the Navi thought they were just one of them. That is precisely what has happened in the um, infiltration of human society by this, uh, this reptilian force. And they end up in the positions of power and the uh, positions of higher and fire. And how it's happened is um, they have been expanding their reach over, in our version of time, thousands of years, out of places like Babylon and Sumer and Egypt and up into the Roman Empire and then up into the British Empire and at that point when the British Empire was at its height and all the Europe other European empires were colonizing the world this was the point when this um, reptilian human cult went global um, they took over the world through colonial um, um, imposition and then when um, it appeared that the colonies were given their freedom 
that's not what happened. They were swapping over control, which has a finite life because the population at least knows who's controlling them. And at some point they'll rebel for covert control. They left out in those countries, the, uh, the, the bloodlines, the, the, um, the, the networks, the secret society networks. And they've gone on controlling those countries ever since. And uh, uh, they, um, they, they went global. They went global in their control with the colonization. And then through the additional um, follow-up decades of globalization, they have centralized power decision-making um, on a global level in every area of our lives. And now they're in, they, they were in a position at the start of the COVID era to, to, to play their end game. But they're still stuck with a big problem. And that is that the target population is numbered in billions and they are numbered in, um, by comparison, in, in, in tiny numbers. So the only way that you can, as that few, control the many is controlling the perceptions of the many, thus the behavior of the many. And what this has done is show them who still has a mind of their own and who still won't be intimidated into submission and those that will. And that's why they're targeting uh, us in that group um, on the scale that they are and trying to break our spirit will become so mar uh, marginalized and broken of spirit that there's nothing that um, we will do to bring this to an end. Um, but there is, and we are. Well, actually, I was just going to say, I know because I've felt this all my life, and um, I've been following you, your books, and, and what you talk about for, for now for decades, too. And one thing is, um, today, you are in a position where millions and millions and millions of people are listening, but they're also realizing you have been right all along, but that wasn't always the case. And so people could ask, what drives David Icke? How come that he went through all of this and still came out this inspired and this empowered? I know I saw a scene in the Renegade movie that moved me to tears because you were moved to tears and you were, you were watching those children um, write the word freedom in the sand. And I remember that scene vividly, a beautiful scene from the movie. And I could feel the, this honest, deep love from you for all that is, not just a, a section or, or a, you know, a portion of society, for all that is, for all of creation. Now, I know you're a father. I know you're a grandfather. And if you look into your heart like you've done so many times, where do you really see um, us as a society, the world, three, four, five years from now? Where do you think are we going and is there going to be a split or is there going to be an ascension? What do you think is going to happen? Well, first of all, that scene in the um, Renegade movie um, was, was just an amazing piece of synchronicity because it, it, it took place. I was looking down on the beach and, and I was on the pier that just down the road from where I'm sitting. Um, and uh, the railway goes up the pier. And so I was saying to the film crew, um, you know, I, there's a place on that pier I used to stand and watch the steam trains go past back in the 1960s. Oh, we'll go, we'll go there before the end of the day, they said, and we'll, we'll, do, we'll film you there, right? So we were doing loads of other things around the island for Renegade. And um, we had no idea when we were gonna go down the pier because of other things that had to be done first. So we ended up at that pier at that spot. And I'm over there looking towards the railway where I think they were gonna film. And, and my son, Jamie was with me. He said, he said, dad, come and look at this. And I walked across and there was a mother and two, uh, uh, two children. And they were writing a big, in big letters, as you say, freedom in, uh, in the sand. And it was just incredibly moving. Uh, because, you know, we come into this simulation. There's lots of, mm, more to know about many things about this, but we come into the simulation uh, to make a difference. And the, the, 
you pass through, uh, you could call it the, um, the, uh, a, a place of forgetfulness, uh, a, 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 an energy field of forgetfulness. And the idea is to remember once you get in this simulation, um, where you come from and what there is beyond it. Um, I, I mean, let's, let's um, just put this in matrix terms. <laughs> you, you, you are in that other earth because what, what, the, um, what the Gnostics described, I think they were spot on. I mean, I, I've come across the same thing, is that this simulation is a copy, a digital copy on one level of the prime reality, because this earth exists in prime reality. And it's on that higher frequency, that higher uh, vibration, that um, much more ethereal vibration. And, uh, and it's heart-centered, and it's a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful place, like creation in general overwhelmingly is. Um, and so what they did was basically take a copy of that. And it's like taking a copy of a website. You take a copy of the website, and now you've got a copy. The original website's still there. You've only taken a copy of it. And that goes on being what it was before, like this other earth uh, is um, still an amazing, wonderful, uh, full of love place. But once you've got your copy, although the original copy is a copy of that, you can now change the copy and you can do what you like to it. And what's been happening since this simulation was created is that it's been changed and changed and changed and changed to go further and further away from what the, the what I'll call it prime earth is prime reality and uh, so you come in and again let's do the matrix thing that that probe goes into the back back of the head you come in perceptually you don't come in physically you come in perceptually and as you come in the memories of um prime earth can disappear with some they, they you can still remember it but they basically disappear. But much as they've tried, there is still a connection to out there and it comes through here. And if this closes and you get pulled into only uh, belly emotion and head thought perception, then you can become completely immersed in the matrix and see no other reality like the five senses just see the matrix but if you can open this you open your heart you retain that connection to out there and the more you open it and the more you um that connection becomes more and more powerful the more you break through the veil of forgetfulness and you start to remember. You start to remember who you really are, where you really come from and where you really are in terms of the simulation. Uh, I mean, it just after the turn of the millennium, I just got so strong from somewhere. We're in a simulation and it, the, the limits of it are the speed of light. And then 20 odd years later, um, science is now uh, scientists more and more in the mainstream are saying well actually it does look like we're in a simulation um and um the the head thinks and it tries to work it out because it doesn't know but the heart that's connected to beyond the simulation does know and that's why intuitive knowing comes as a package it doesn't come as a sequence of thought that reaches a conclusion. The conclusion comes fully, fully uh, uh, in full. It's like, I just know, I just know. Oh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I just know. That's the difference. Um, and, you know, you can remember, you can feel 
where we come from and, and, and the, the scale of love that's there, where we come from. And we came into this simulation to, to, to try to um, break the stranglehold that this reptilian force, this ultimately go, go out of that into Watiko, this distorted consciousness has on humanity. And once, once you start to um, feel these things and understand these things, what well, happens on many levels is that level, I just know what this could be. I can know, know what's out there and, and how this is not how creation is meant to be. This is, this is just a, um, a very, very dark place. The Gnostics describe the same thing. But there's other levels too, uh, which drive you on. When you can see where this um, sequence is taking people to get even more and more extreme in this simulation as they change the, the website, if you like, more and more and more and more from what it originally was, then you can't walk down the street and look, look kids in the eye. You can't look your own kids in the eye, your own grandkids in the eye. You have to do everything you can to, um, to make a difference. And what I can't understand, and I've experienced it many times, is over this 31, 32 years I've been doing this, I've seen people come in and they realize something's going on and then they disappear. And some other people come up and they're flavor of the month for a you know, short time and then they disappear. And I look at it and I think, how can you walk away? If you claim to know where this is going, how can you walk away and leave people to their fate? I can't do that. And, I, I, and um, I'm driven by wanting to break the stranglehold that this force has on human perception. And I'm driven by wanting to know the truth. I don't want a statue I don't want a round of applause. And if from the other side comes abuse and ridicule, that is all irrelevant to me. I want to know the truth and I shall pursue it no matter what the consequences, because I don't even think about consequences. People have said to me, when you, when you said that, didn't you know you get ridicule? Well, do you know I'd work that out? But I'm going to say it anyway. Because it's about uncovering your truth and then speaking it. Not uncovering your truth and then keeping quiet about it and, uh, because you, you don't want uh, other people to think badly of you. I say to people, you know, don't this prison that people live in, the fear of what other people think. If you live in a prison like most people do of fearing what other people think, you're not you anymore. Never mind handing over your self-respect, you've handed over your uniqueness. You're now molding yourself to become what other people think you should be. Where, where have you gone? We are part of a infinite uh, expression of consciousness, all possibility, all potential. But we are unique expressions of that. As a, as a unique series of experiences and perceptions that have created us, that have, that have, um, that have made us what we are. And we sh there is no uh, contradiction between seeing that we're all one, that we're all expressions, points of attention within an infinite whole, and celebrating the uniqueness of our particular perceptual point. And if you start fearing what other people think about you, you start editing yourself. You start censoring yourself. Shall I say this uh, or what shall I say so these people think I'm OK? Well, I don't care what those people think of me. They have every right to think of me whatever they choose to think of me. 
That's their right. That's their choice. That's their freedom. Freedom is not the freedom to have everyone agree with you. Freedom is the freedom for people to have their own opinion, whatever it is. But it's also my freedom to speak my truth, and I'm going to do so, and nothing's going to stop me. No level of ridicule, no level of abuse, no level of intimidation, none of it. Because once you open your heart to beyond the, beyond the, uh, the simulation, out into prime reality, then you lose the intimidation that comes with fear. Fear is not only the, the currency of control. Fear is the controller. This Buatiko consciousness, this inverted um, state of consciousness, this chaotic, uh, distorted state of consciousness that's seeking to pull human consciousness into itself and assimilate it is what we call fear. It is itself fear. And that's why it wants many reasons and many advantages of doing this, but there's a key foundation that people miss. When you fall into states of fear, you fall into the frequency of that which is fear, and the fear is what the Native Americans call Watiko. It is fear. That's why this cult is so fearful constantly of exposure. It's why it wants to control everything, because its insecurity comes from a state of fear. It is fear. It's, it's, it's how fear came into the world. You talk to people out there who, who've been out there. They're not states of fear. This whole uh, society we call human, which is the simulation, is founded on fear. Why? Because the consciousness that's behind it is itself fear. So when you open your heart, you move beyond Watiko. Your frequency reaches a point that you're operating on that Watiko can't touch. That's why it doesn't want love. That's why it doesn't want a society involving love. Because what, when, once you have love and joy, you're out of the lair, the frequency lair of Watiko. And therefore it can't touch you and it can't influence you and it can't manipulate you. Oh. And one of the great things that, I mean, I've been on many of these, uh, I mean, most of them actually, these, um, these great marches in London uh, for freedom since, uh, well, through most of this um, COVID era. And uh, what hits you is the joy, the laughter, the love among those people. Because seeing it, seeing it in the wider sense and your consciousness state are the same thing. So this is another thing, you know, love is, is, love is knowledge, love is, um, intelligence, innate intelligence, untaught intelligence, known intelligence, all-knowing intelligence. And so this is the answer. On every level, this is the answer. And people think love is weak. Love is the ultimate power. Why? Because it doesn't have that which takes your power away. It doesn't have fear. And you put all these things together and this is why once I started to awaken myself and I started to see what's going on, there was no level of ridicule or abuse that was going to stop me or shut me up. And this, this is what I would say to people. I hope I'm an example of it. Speak your truth. It doesn't matter what people think of you for speaking your truth. Because I know from experience, they'll think something else tomorrow. And if what you're saying has validity, eventually it will be shown to be so. 
And then instead of you trotting on towards the world as you're told to believe it, the world starts coming to you. And you start living life instead of life living you. You just do whatever that you're told to do. That's not what happens when you open your heart. Your heart won't have that. And if you keep speaking your truth and keep speaking your truth, then not only um, won't you care how people uh, think about you and uh, how they behave towards you, you start attracting in other people who are on that same vibe and suddenly your life changes and your, 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 the people that, that are in your life change if, if they don't move with you. And um, you realize that life doesn't have to be what you thought it was. It can be an adventure. It can be a joy. It can be um, a, a, a unique expression of you. It does, you don't have to be a clone of a system just like everyone else. And uh, it's, um, it's only when the bubble bursts, you realize you've been in one. Because this world seems so real in its, in its way it seems through the five senses. But once the bubble bursts and you connect with out there, you realize what a prison you've been in. And it's been a mind prison. And the mind prison is, um, creating what we perceive, what we experience as a physical prison, but everything is a mind prison. And we need to take our minds back and um, break out of this prison cell of the five senses. And then the, 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 the walls of this, um, the walls of this uh, prison, this mind prison will fall. Because it's like, um, like the Buddha is quoted as saying, um, the mind that perceives limitation is the limitation. The mind that perceives little me is the little me. They're not real. They're what you perceive them to be, what you perceive, you believe, what you believe, you experience. You change your perception, you change your self identity, drop all the human labels, the IMRs, as I call them, and realize they're just experiences, what you are is the consciousness, ultimately all consciousness, that's having that experience. And when you realize that, you um, expand, as, as your self-identity expands into I am consciousness, so the swathe of possibility and probability, uh, uh, the, the field of consciousness all around us, so you go deeper and deeper and deeper into that. And suddenly you can manifest uh, a much greater range of possibility and probability. That's why when people start to awaken, they notice all this synchronicity in their life. My God, fancy seeing you here. What's the chances of that? Wasn't happening before. It wasn't happening before because your, and this is one of the great uh, truths that this cult wants to keep from us because it knows this. Your perception is a frequency. Every time we think, every time we feel, we're generating a frequency depending and relating to those thoughts and those emotions. And so what we call perception is actually the sum total of that field generated by our emotions and by our thoughts and by the heart if we open it. And so if we think us of ourselves in limited terms, in little me terms, in I must do what I'm told terms, then that is a self-identity, a perception based on limitation. And so therefore, you're living in a tiny bubble of perception, a limited bubble of perception, a limited frequency band of perception, because that's your perception of you. So it expresses itself energetically and in terms of frequency. And so you're interacting with the field of possibility and probability within that narrow, narrow band in which you perceive yourself, in which you perceive the I. Little me, I have no power. I must follow. But when you um, expand your awareness, you expand your self-identity, 
into I am all that is, has been, and ever can be, having a human experience, then that expansion of self-identity expands the field that you're operating on. It expands the frequency, it expands the, the scale. Now you're interacting with possibility and probability in a much, much greater range. And thus, synchronicity comes into your life. Bits of luck. I was with someone uh, recently. They, they came over to see me. It was, she was there about three days. And um, it was, she was laughing in the end because every time we get, went somewhere and there's a big um, flow of parked cars, you know, both sides of the road, there would be <laughs> there would be a gap in the parked cars outside where we were going and i was straight in and other times you're coming along and there's no space and then somebody just pulls out <laughs> in front of you and you're in now these are little things but because our perceptions become our reality you can manifest these things because this is not a solid world. This is an energetic world, a holographic world that's malleable. You can change it. And this cult knows that our perceptions become our experience reality. This is the big truth. Why do they call them secret societies? Because they're keeping secrets and they keep these secrets at the deepest levels. So they know that if they can through control of information, uh, control of the education system, control of the media and so on, if they can program your perception, they can dictate your experience because they know that whatever your perception is will, will create your experience. And the reason they don't want us to know that, obviously, is because that gives us a power back. Change my perception, change my life. What they want to you to think is we're living in a random, solid, physical world in which everything is just happening by accident, when actually it's being created by the perceptions of the population. They know that. We control perception, we control the world. We take it back, their control of the world is over. That's the level this is going to change. And this is the big picture the big picture. David, I want to thank you um, first and foremost, really from my heart on a personal level, um, because when I first, for the first time, picked up one of your books many, many years ago, it was the first time that I could read and hear your thoughts. And I finally had something to connect my own thoughts and feelings with, because I, I couldn't see anyone else out there who felt or thought what I was thinking until I picked up your book and finally found, okay, this resonates so deeply because I felt this about my reality. So first and foremost, thank you from my heart, but thank you also for taking the time for your body of work, wisdom, and guidance, and for this beautiful love that you're uh, showing to the world as a shining light. I think this is the most beautiful thing. And um, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine something more beautiful than the big picture you've just given us and given the Inspire Tribe and everyone who listens. So thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of the whole Inspire Tribe. And uh, last but not least, in an ever-changing digital world and censorship, what's the best place to find you for people to connect with you, what you're putting out, what you're sharing these days? Well, um, the, the, the main site for the news and all my videos is called davidike.com. Uh, the, the, the news stories go up there every day, but put into context because it's not only what's going on, that's only one level, um, it's why it's going on mm -hmm. and how that connects to that and that story connects to that. that that's where, the, um, that's where the, uh, the, the mist clears when you see the connections. Uh, and all my videos are there, I do videos all the time. Uh, and then um, we've um, we've got a video uh, or not a video, a um, media platform called Iconic, which my son Jamie started only two years ago. And it's absolutely been amazing, the speed that's grown. And this is a platform that uh, is about the whole range of alternative information, not just the manipulation. It's about the nature of reality. I, I'm, there's a series about in the middle of it now. I did a. 13 part series on the nature of reality with special effects and everything 
which is um, on uh, Iconic now. And um, uh, there's, uh, there's news programs. My, my son, uh, Gareth, uh, does one every uh, Friday uh, called Right Now, which is really the, the topical things of the week. But there's great documentaries about the nature of reality, about, about emotion, about consciousness, about psychology and uh, that food, and every, everything you could think of. Um, it's just incredible. It's like an alternative Netflix, if you like. But there's some very cutting edge and, and very cutting uh, documentaries there, original documentaries for, that Iconic make. And uh, I have been amazed how fast it's grown. And uh, Jamie deserves enormous credit for what he's created. Wonderful. Th thank you again. Thank you to the whole Ike family, extended family. I know, um, you know, every, everyone's involved in this and everyone's heart is in it. So thank you so much for all the work you do, for the time you've given us today. And we hope to... Uh, have you back soon. Thank you, David. From the bottom of our heart, Inspired Tribe, thank you for watching. David Icke, everyone. Uh, the big picture. Thank you.